Um, you're libertarians, I'm conservative, we intersect with each other. Um, I sometimes think libertarians have slightly excessive enthusiasm for, uh, uh, for um, salvation. So I think you need to be aware that political idealism is a very dangerous kind of thing. Um, you will have realized my subject is absurd. Uh, and therefore, all I can do is provide you with a sketch of a position. Um, uh, part of the reason for my paper is that um, libertarianism and individualism are both under current attack <coughs> as being selfish and indifferent to the common good. In the Sunday Telegraph, uh, I think last week, we have a headline, Britain, the world's most selfish society, and it is making us depressed. I hope you are not depressed. Anyway, um, I think that we need to respond to the situation with something a little bit more sophisticated than Hayek and Adam Smith and the glories of the free market. So let me move on to defining political idealism. By which I mean, quite simply, any belief that we can find a better system of society than the one we have. Uh, and the key word there is the word system. It is the belief that human beings always live within a system. And a system is a set of interrelated parts that always produce a reliable outcome. Um, political idealists commonly think that we live already in a system, and therefore the point is to find a better system. The system we are thought to live in is called capitalism. Uh, the better system is often called, well, socialism is one of the many variants of it. Nationalism was another one. Uh, the view that if only the empires of the world could be broken up and uh, humanity was a set of discrete totally independent national units all governing themselves, this would, um, would be a better world. Or the um, Adolf Hitler's um, view that um, there is a racial hierarchy in the world which has been confused by a number of vile and uh, ideological people, most of them Jews, and if only we could get the racial uh, hierarchy straight, then we would live in a better world. That's a different system which he tried to, uh, to bring about. So the vogue for systems is, um, can I think be dated fairly precisely to the thing called the Enlightenment. So let me plug it in to the legend of the Enlightenment. I say legend because what the Enlightenment is, is a major question of um, dispute amongst historians in many ways. But I think somewhere around 1700, uh, a lot of people, particularly um, um, intelligentsia, advanced thinkers and so on, abandoned the belief that we lived in a fallen world, the belief you get from Genesis and so on, and moved into the idea that we don't live in a fallen world, we live in an imperfect society. And here were a set of people who were developing a technological civilization of great force. And what you do with imperfections is you get rid of them. So the project became creating a better system than the one that we already had. And the history of European politics since about 1700 is, I think, the history of people with new, new conceptions of what a good system would be, um, trying to bring it about. What this meant was that politics moved into two gears. Whereas previously there was the ordinary governing uh, project of kings and ministers in which they sustained whatever beliefs about justice they had and they fought wars and they grabbed territory and did all the usual things that states did and had been doing. But secondly, there was another level of politics at which there was a hope that um, the levers of power could be seized by people who took seriously the idea 
of a new and better system. And obviously, the French Revolution was the first great triumph of this political idealism, and so was the Bolshevik Revolution and many other revolutions that have happened since. We thus need, according to political idealists, a better society. The question then becomes, what constitutes a better society? You can do this, you can answer that question either empirically by looking at what most societies are like, but I shall take the short a priori shortcut. Most people living in societies live on the edges of starvation, they've got lots of enemies, uh, life is pretty unsatisfactory, they have to work too hard for what they get and all the rest of it. <laughs> what they basically want is to live within a harmony, a harmonious society. What is the key to a harmonious society? Well, it must be managed from the top to the bottom so that you have a ruler at the top uh, who has the right ideas and then you have intermediate stages right down to the family. And the family is a rule usually by men, but then the men rule the women and children, but then the women run the children and then the uh, elder children run the younger children. So, in other words, this is a system in which nearly everybody, unless you're at the bottom of the heap like a slave, has some sort of power. Somebody is above you and somebody is below you. This is a hierarchical world. It is based upon the idea that there is one right order within which everybody should live. And this one right order is given usually in the religion of the, um, uh, of the particular society. It's given also, of course, in the customs. And it's given above all in the power which is exercised by the ruler of um, such a society. Now, these societies are maybe illustrated by almost any tribal society you care to mention. Tribes, I take it, are relatively small groups of people who have managed to find a way of uh, living which is ideally adapted to whatever their physical circumstances are. They may be desert or they may be uh, ice or arctic circumstances, but these are usually quite small. They don't have a written language. They have very little capacity for abstract thought. And these are today known as indigenous peoples. They're estimated, I think, at about 250 million of them. But the more impressive civilizations that belong to what I'm calling the, 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 the one right order societies would be illustrated by the Muslim Sharia, uh, by the Hindu caste system, four basic castes, but I think there are said to be over 200 in practice, and many variations on the caste system. The, um, the obedience structure of imperial China, in which uh, the elder always had um, um, authority over the younger. Indeed, authority is, authority is a European word. Politics is a European word. It's very hard to give an account of what these civilizations were like without using words which put you slightly to one side. You get it slightly wrong. You see, there's no politics in one sense anywhere else except in the European world. Uh, and politics emerged during feudalism and after feudalism and so on. It comes out of uh, Roman civil association and, um, and uh, the republics of, of, the, of the Greek classical age. But these um, societies that I'm talking about are all, I think, despotism. Some enlightened, some less enlightened. They have been immensely powerful and often very much richer than, uh, than Western Europe. And they're all very impressive. But they have certain limits which are different from the limits with which we are familiar. Um, Now, 
we might ask the question, do we in the West have a drive towards ideal political systems, towards one right order of things? And the answer is, yes, indeed we do. We have lots of them. And that is the essential point which distinguishes uh, European societies, I think, from any other uh, kind of societies. Um, in the 20th century, we acquired in the form of ideologies a whole set of um, beliefs that were expected to transform the world, in particularly, I mean, you'll be totally familiar with this in Russia, uh, in, in China, in Cambodia, in Cuba, in lots of other places. These were all new systems which were expected to be better and were usually dramatically and murderously worse than anything that happened in our own dear Anglo-Saxon and more broadly speaking European world. Now the question then becomes how do we characterize our own civilization? What is the difference between Western civilization on the one hand and what I am suggesting to you is virtually the rest of the world uh, which has grown up in terms of one notion of one right order of things. And I think I would want to characterize our civilization as being ambivalent. That is to say, we are accustomed to having very various and different opinions about nearly everything. Institutions, um, attitudes, peoples, races, uh, the economy, religions. We have disagreement about all of them. This is a highly contested world uh, in which we live. Less contested, I think, than it used to be. But it's, um, it's, it's pretty notably um, um, full of conflict in a way in which one right order societies are not. The point about one right order societies is that um, goodness is fitting in with the order and badness or evil is deviation from it. Um, in our moral world, um, that simple uh, distinction does not fully operate. I mean, we distinguish between legal and illegal and moral and immoral categories. These days, sometimes, God help us, we distinguish between the acceptable and the unacceptable. But by and large, there are so many opinions on all of this subject that nobody uh, can possibly lay down the law. The point is that we have created a civil order. That is to say, an order um, whose relationships do not in the least depend upon agreeing with the people we talk to. Indeed, you can go one stage further and you can say that we have a certain taste for dealing with independent other people. If they're not uh, independent, the other people we talk to, we regard them as toadies or creeps or people who are sucking up to us. Um, we very much dislike those who do not share our sense of an independent attitude to the, uh, to the way um, we should behave. Now we like it that way, um, or at least some of us do in some moods, but does not this world in which we live, this world of contestation, also have its imperfections? Well, of course indeed it does. One of them, according to some people, is inequality. Some are more successful than others, although we certainly disagree about whether we should admire the successful or whether we should perhaps admire people who are poor and impoverished. Poverty uh, is, for some of us, a sort of chosen way of life and we um, admire them because these are people who are not seduced by luxury and consumerism and so on. So that inequality is, like everything else in the West, something that is regarded with ambivalence. Sometimes we think it's a bad thing, and sometimes we think it's quite a good thing. 
Another feature of our civilization is that it has long resisted becoming incorporated into an empire. Um, you see, um, China is and was for a long period one single empire uh, under one ruler, the emperor. The uh, Muslim world never attained that, but nonetheless the aim of a caliphate was the hope that this would happen some time. Uh, the Hindu world has been, uh, but of course, lost its, uh, its primacy. So we had, have resisted, we've managed to resist the bid by the Catholic Church, by the Habsburgs, by the French Bourbons, by Napoleon, the Prussians, Hitler and the Communists, all of whom tried to turn Europe into a single empire, and they all failed. Uh, it looks perhaps as if this may now be, in, uh, be happening. The point, however, is that we have, um, we have a very warlike history in Europe. We have fought endless wars. It's not that there aren't lots of wars and disharmonies going on amongst other people, but nonetheless, we have, we have a fairly consistent record of fighting each other uh, in limited and occasionally in unlimited ways. Uh, so we have class war, we have national disputes, conflicts between them. So we have lots of imperfections and therefore if your aim is to seek another system, there are plenty of imperfections and you can obviously project uh, better worlds. And I think socialism is almost the standard issue uh, system advanced by, um, by those who want a better system. Now, there are further imperfections. There is an imperfection of a specifically moral kind, according to some people. Uh, you may have observed that what I am saying owes quite a lot to the French thinker Montesquieu. Montesquieu thought that there were three different basic kinds of society and regime. One of them was despotism based on fear, another was republics based upon virtue, and then there were monarchies, and monarchies were based upon the notion of honour. Uh, he, he found that he was living in a monarchy. He didn't much like it, he thought it was a monarchy almost on the edge of despotism. But nonetheless, that was what Europe was about. It was monarchical. And the nice thing about the monarchies of Europe was that most of them were pretty much um, bound by the rule of law, so that you could live a life in which you were not in fear of being interfered with by those above. I mean, the classic um, um, one right order stories that would be found in the Arabian Nights um, uh, stories. The, the story, for example, that Wittfogel uses in describing oriental despotism of the market trader who turns up one day and finds a dead body in his stall. And the most important thing to do with this dead body is to get rid of it because he knows that the police will finger him. Uh, as the murderer. So he moves the body over to another market stall who, on turning up, also finds a body and moves this corpse around. So the corpse moves from place to place and eventually ends up in the river uh, because everybody is scared stiff of what the authorities will do under these circumstances. Now that kind of fear was not to be found in um, modern monarchies, according to Montesquieu. Um, and roughly speaking, that was perfectly true. He thought that England was an interesting case of something halfway between a monarchy and a republic, uh, de and depended very much upon virtue if it was to sustain its, um, its sense of freedom. Now, what is the significance of this point about honour? Well, what it means morally is that when um, a European considers um, what ought to be done, he has two things in his mind. The first thing is what is the right thing to do. 
and I need hardly tell you that there's quite a lot of controversy about what the right thing to do always is. But the second thing that's in his mind is um, what is the relation between my action and my conception of myself. I mean, a, um, a, a, a European moral agent with a sense of the moral life uh, knows perfectly well that he will not steal, he will not uh, um, lie about um, his friends and various other virtues. There are a set of virtues that people have in their conception of themselves. If, if you're a mafioso, for example, you will not sing like a canary when the police interview you. I mean, these virtues that people have are not always uh, admirable things. But nonetheless, there are clearly these two dimensions to the moral life. Now, the interest of that, you see, is that in a despotism, uh, according to Montesquieu, your basic impulse is guided by fear. In a republic, then your basic impulse is to do the virtuous thing, which is defined by the notion that the, there is a public-spirited thing that virtuous republicans do. So in other words, in a republic, if you have the right ideas in your head, you will automatically do the right thing. In a monarchy, by contrast, you might do the right thing, but the moral issue gets um, confused by the fact that you will be considering your honour as well as whatever the right thing to do might seem to you to be. Now, this is why the, um, the English anarchist William Godwin, for example, called the English system of moral understanding a gospel of indirection. In other words, people didn't do the virtuous thing because it was virtuous. They, they did it for a variety of reasons, and one of them was their own personal response to the world. So this is, um, this is an important distinction, and as far as Godwin and quite a lot of other um, projectors of political ideals are concerned, this is a very bad thing. You see, um, the Bolshevik revolution in Russia was certainly not concerned in any way with the honour of, a, of, of a, a Bolshevik. There was a right thing to do and you ought to do it. The right thing was what is best for the community, as Lenin or Stalin or whoever defined it, and you should go directly to it. So there is an important distinction in the moral world between this kind of moral world on the one hand and the um, notionally superior world in which people do the right thing because they have the right ideas. Um, now, there's a further point, I think, which is important about Western civilization in relation to one right order states. One right order states are remarkably uncurious about what goes on in the rest of the world. You see, the Chinese were the Middle Kingdom, and they knew that everything outside the Middle Kingdom was bar barbarous. Barbar only barbarians lived outside the Confucian world of China. Um, the Muslims were also remarkably incurious about these things because they knew that everybody else simply was an infidel um, who did not submit to the, um, the, the, the rule of the universe and therefore did not properly understand uh, how they ought to behave. And they took no interest in these people. Um, I mean, uh, Arabic writers very seldom mentioned or took any notice of what was going on in Europe. Montesquieu himself wrote a work called Persian Letters, which is partly a satire about France, but partly reflects an interest in Persia. There are no Iranians, no Persians, who wrote a book called French Letters, uh, which would, I suppose, be an unlikely title for, uh, for a... Um, 
book of this kind. Again, the Ottoman Empire, um, it is often said that our 18, the 18th century understanding of the Ottoman Empire was Orientalist, we didn't take it seriously enough. But there's nothing to balance it. The Ottomans had no interest in Europeans, except that they were quite simply wrong. By contrast, um, Western civilization is remarkably curious and inventive about the past of humanity. I mean, archaeology, anthropology, academic history, and so on, these are all um, forms of inquiry which have illuminated the cultures of other civilizations no less than our own civilization. The thing about, of course, about um, uh, this world is that if you live in that sort of society, the only reason you take an interest in outsiders is because they're smart in some respect or another. They're very good at cannons or guns or military power. And that's, of course, what made all of these people take an interest in the West. And much the best account of the, the, the dramas of this kind is to be found, I think, in a book called Confucian China and its Modern Fate by a man called Joseph Levinson, a Californian, I think he was at Stanford. Um, and here you find the Chinese first saying, yeah, these are clever little monkeys from the West. We must, uh, we must adopt their principles of building cannons and so on. But then they found it didn't do them any good. They had to advance a bit further. They had to take on board certain of the social aspects of European life, which made Europeans so militarily formidable. And they kept on having to go further and further until these poor, miserable people discovered Bolshevism, Marxism, and they imagined that with one mighty bound, they could rid themselves of westernization and advance into the future, into the, the, the communist future, um, without having to bother with the West. And what they ended up, poor devils, with was Maoism, um, and the, from which, of course, they are slowly um, disentangling themselves. So all of this is, I think, the um, part of the drama of, um, of the relation between Western societies and, um, and uh, one right order societies. Now, I have, uh, I said I would not go beyond um, 40 minutes. So let me make, uh, I suppose, my basic point to which all of this has been a preliminary. It is that there is amongst us a political ideal. We've had lots of political ideals like socialism and we have egalitarianism and so on. What do these things amount to in terms of our civilization? Well, the answer, I think, is that they are all attempts to substitute for the conflicts and tensions by which we live a single virtue. The distinction, the basic thing, of course, is, is that our politics, and we uh, are the inventors of politics, that hardly exists outside um, uh, the, the Western world, although um, nearly everybody these days has elections and some sort of presidency and, and, and uh, some moderately plausible and sometimes totally implausible imitation of Western politics. Um, so politics is simply one aspect in which people have taken on board Western values. But the basic principle of Western politics is the distinction, very late arriving in our own society, between government and opposition. I mean, it's, what is it, 1828, I think, somebody in the House of Commons talks about Her Majesty, His Majesty's loyal opposition. And you can see what a dramatic paradox this was. So it's quite late, but nonetheless, opposition has always been very powerful in, uh, in Western states, going back to Magna Carta and before Magna Carta and, and things of that sort. So our politics is based on contestation. Um, our economic system is a distinction between rich and poor. 
But that appears to be an imperfection because some people appear to lose out in our economic circumstances. So we need one virtue, benevolence and egalitarianism. Uh, there used to be a, uh, a, a notion that every society ought to have the same religious belief. Um, we've given that one up. And it must be admitted that my simplified image of Western civilization is a matter of taking bits from earlier centuries and assembling them together and suggesting that there is one key factor in Western civilization, which is this ambivalence leading to contestation. And let me say finally that I think that in this respect, Western civilization uh, accords with the nature of human, of human beings as a whole. That is, all human beings are ambivalent in their attitudes to um, nearly everything. But in one right order societies, they are forced to adopt the single attitude uh, mandated by um, the one right order, which is usually also a religious and supernatural order as well. Um, but people are largely um, um, ambivalent and they rather like the possibility of ambivalence. There is one final characteristic about one right order societies which is that they can probably only work if people are ignorant of the alternatives. Um, you see the reason why communism fell was that you couldn't prevent the Russians from, or the East Germans, etc., from knowing that there was a world elsewhere, that across this imprisoning wall in Berlin, there was a way of life that um, they thought was probably a good deal better, and they wanted it. And similarly, um, in a way, even the Muslim world, which is pretty tight, uh, can only be sustained if there is no recognized alternative to it. The same goes for the Chinese, but the Chinese are now adapting, of course, to, to, uh, to the present. These things change, but the point about our present situation is that there are millions of people trying to get the hell out of one right order societies and get into uh, the kinds of societies that we have managed to create. Now that's the sense in which political idealism threatens our civilization because it is the project of substituting a virtue of benevolence, a virtue of equality, a, a single idea of what a good perfect society might be like for the quarrels and contestations by which we live. And that I think is a deep threat to how we live. Anyway, that's, a, that's a, a rather rapid sketch of, of a position that I think I may claim is slightly more complicated if I have more time to work on. Great. I've got about 20 minutes to, yeah, to field. If, if there's any, anything to... Yeah, um, obviously, correct me if I'm wrong, you said at the beginning that libertarianism is one of the, or at least the sort of liberty movement, is um, an, 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 an ideology, so one of the ideals that you're claiming is quite dangerous. Well, there are some people who, um, <laughs> who are such enthusiasts yes. for the free market that, um, you know, I'm, I'm an anti-enthusiast. Right. And uh, I get a little nervous sometimes. I mean, I'm a conservative, and by and large... The problem I have is what the hell do we conserve? Because the the public life of Britain and of most Anglophone societies um, is so dominated by the wreck of bright projects in the past, like state education and uh, and uh, you know welfare state and so on. That I don't know I don't know how you would change that, but I think you'd have to change it relatively slowly and. Um, um, you know, that's, that's why I think the notion that, that uh, if you had uh, pure free market society, it would all come out right, 
it's not true. I think Aristotle was right in believing that um, there are natural slaves and um, natural masters. It's not as if any single individual is a natural slave or a natural master, but I think slavishness and uh, independence are sort of in balance and tension within everybody's lives. Okay. Um, yeah. Philosophically, at least, it's not the, is the libert isn't libertarianism, or at least sort of anarcho-libertarianism, the absence of any ideology or ideal. I mean, if you view if you view perfect liberty, so for example, the free market, as just the absence of any social order possible, that or arbitrary social order or monopolisation, um, surely then it's sort of the conservative views that certainly the, the, any, any view uh, that's not based on liberty is in some way an infringement upon that sort of perfect lack of ideals. So, if, if, we, take, if we take a libertarian interaction between two people, yeah. it's just reaching a mutual compromise of two very different and ambivalent beliefs. Yeah. Um, surely that would be your ideal then, uh, as opposed to some sort of... Outcome. I don't know that I have an ideal. Um, I think sometimes that would be an excellent thing, sometimes not. It simply depends upon the circumstances. I mean, I regard the whole world as a human world, as a tissue of contingencies, you know. It's like a conversation. You get, you, you lock into this and you can't understand what the hell is happening unless you know what the previous person said. And you say something and they respond to it and the responses continue. But there isn't any single way uh, which is the right way to respond. And li that's what liberty is about, you see. When... Uh, I mean, it's very hard to define freedom, and it's, in fact, almost impossible to, to define, but it is the way of life that we lead with modifications. But I'd better not go rambling on. The, the trouble with all questions is that, um, is that you start pursuing hairs in every direction. Um, yeah? Um. Why do you think effectively we went right? What was the reason that the West Europe turned out so different from the rest of the world? Ah, What's the wrong? Where did we go wrong? That's, that's a whole um, uh, very interesting question indeed. And I think the answer would have to be Christianity is a big kick. There, there, there's an Australian called Hurst who's written a short history of, um, of, of uh, European civilization in which he says it's based on three propositions. The first is that the Greeks believed that the world was logical and mathematical. The Christians believed that Jesus saved and we lived in a fallen world and the Germans believed that fighting was fun. <laughs> it's not bad. As a, as a summary of Western civilization, it's not bad. You'd have to have an additional thing about Roman law and, and stuff like that. But I think that Christianity is the crucial thing. Uh, Hilaire Belloc claims that Christianity abolished slavery inherited from the Roman Empire. And it's perfectly true that Western Europe goes into the feudal period with masters and slaves and comes out with, uh, at the end of the feudal system, there aren't any slaves around. I mean, there are agricultural laborers and serfs and people like that, but no slaves. And then, I suppose, Western Europe abolished slavery a second time when um, Wilberforce and that set of people. So, in other words, there is something, as it were, freedom-loving in the West, which is always hostile to slavery in any form. Um, the crucial thing, of course, is giving to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and under God the things that are God's. It's the, it's the distinction between the private and the public world. So there is, I think, a hell of a lot. This is undoubtedly a Christian civilization. Whether you believe in Christianity or not, you know, these days is, is, is another question altogether. But that, it could not have happened without Christianity, I think, is... Um, you know, as close to a, a historical truth as I can find. Yep. So, Christianity is an ideology, though. Uh, define an ideology. Well, I thought that that was your job. Yes, it is. Um, but an ideology is a is a system uh, 
believed to be scientific in one sense or another, um, telling you what would be a more perfect way of living. Uh, Christianity, although it you see it, it's often dogmatic and has its, its persecutory moments, uh, describes itself as a faith. Now, science has often uh, toyed with the idea of certainty. You know, can we have certain knowledge in Bacon and Descartes and so on? Uh, Christianity sometimes behaves in this way, but basically it, um, it uh, sees itself as a faith. Now, a faith... It seems to me that the, the, the use of the word faith to describe all religions is amongst the confusions of life. I don't think Islam is a faith. It's a certainty. That's what it's believed to be. Uh, I don't know what the, the logical basis of Hinduism is, uh, and they're trying to get rid of castes and all that, that sort of thing. Christianity, however, I, I think has a, that's logically slightly different from other religions. You know, the, the categories of religion and faith and so on need to be treated like every other category with a certain amount of care. Yeah. But Christianity has been, been enforced on people with a lot of ideological bigger, as if this is the truth. It's certainly been enforced upon people, yeah, you bet. Um, beliefs have, but um, that ideologies are often forced upon people it does not follow that whatever is forced upon people is an ideology. This is converting the A proposition, it used to be called in logic. So the Catholics are enforcing a faith, whereas the Muslims are enforcing an ideology? Is that no, no, the Muslims are enforcing a religion. Uh, it's certainly a religion. Uh, the, the question is, what is the logical basis of it? Now, the belief is... Uh, the belief in... Uh, in... Um, uh, Islam is that this is the word of God, of God directly, you know, transmitted, and is therefore authoritative, and nothing else can compete with that. The uh, Christianity has aspects of this. I mean, Islam is a kind of amalgam of Judaic and Christian um, um, scriptures, but I think it's 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 different in that um, uh, you see. Um, um, a, a saviour who gets himself crucified on the cross is a very different kind of um, saviour from um, a prophet who has a sword. If you go to the Topkapi Museum in Istanbul, you will see the sword of the prophet and of the first caliph, the second and the third caliph. These are people with swords in their hands. They're a different kind of thing from Christianity. God flooded the whole Sorry? God flooded the whole world. God what? I haven't... Christianity is based on violence, don't know. Based on is violence. it based on violence? Is it I mean, it's... Is that Christianity is just fine? Fluffy? No, no. Chris, Christianity is, is like any other human belief. It is full of, uh, you know, a vehicle of folly and occasionally a vehicle of, of wisdom. Um, in, if, in, in principle, it is a belief in peace and forgiveness. Um, this is, however, a gang of people who are militarily extremely competent. So it's not that they can't fight, or that Christianity is incompatible with, you know, with military force. But the, the, the status of military force is different in these various civilizations, isn't it? Uh, you, you can't see a difference, is that right? I can't really see just I, mean, I, don't I don't know how you justify it or anything else. The question is, what is the difference? Well, well, you're saying that the Christian society is less violent than the Islamic society. No, I mean, I'm sure is, some Islamic societies are much less violent than, say, the Inquisition in Spain. But what follows from that? I just don't really understand the point you're making. And that this exception... This now, which, exception which is the point... Formulate the point you do not understand. Well, that Christianity is this faith that didn't really form itself as an ideology because it wasn't at the end of a sword as was Islam. I don't think there's any profit in trying to decide whether Christianity is an, is an ideology um, simply because it raises so many definitional questions that we slide all over the place. I think Christianity is, um, you see, uh, an ideology... Uh, the ideologue were invented by Destut de 
Racine, what is it, uh, 1798 or something. The whole idea of ideology was then developed by Marx and Engels and it plays an important role in European politics and everybody's politics since that time. Religions are a different kind of thing. I mean, they have a lot of affinities with ideologies, but um, they're, you see, unlike um, ideologies, they are not usually um, perfectionist claims to a better system or a better world. I mean, Christianity is essential. You can't make a perfect world. You know, it's human beings are creatures of disordered passions and nothing straight, as Kant famously said, of the crooked timber of humanity, nothing straight can be made. That's a straightforward Christian doctrine. Um, I think in Islam, if you had total obedience, you would have a perfect world. But I don't know. I mean, these are, um, I'm no expert on Islam, but, um, or indeed on Christianity for that matter. Yeah, sure. Um, well, just uh, going on what you're saying, um, is, it, is it the case that this distinction is um, more about that in Islam, then it's become very politicized, whereas Christianity is not politicized. Is that kind of what the point you were trying to make? Or? Um, I don't think it's the point I was quite trying to make, but it is a perfectly good point that um, the people whom who are often called jihadists um, are a kind of westernized version and politicized version of Islam. That if Islam as a religion is completely different from people, you know, uh, massacring or blowing up uh, people, but there's a lot of political Islam around, and um, um, Muslims do seem to have in large numbers a certain weakness for bombs and stuff like that. Um, but I think it is legitimate to say that, um, that Islam as a religion is quite different from that. Yeah? So, um, I, I think that your sort of excursion into uh, the universe of Christianity is trying to explain uh, what you think to be an exceptional level of pluralism in the West. Right? So, exceptional level, level of pluralism. Of oh, pluralism, well, yes. I think that this is yes. what you mean by, by politics. Right? Yes. So you, you said politics doesn't exist elsewhere, which I think to be clearly false, but I, I think that your claim that I mean is to is something like pluralism there's exceptional levels of pluralism yes. in the West. Yeah. Um, and so I, I think that you all sort of mention of Christianity is trying to explain something of, of that. Yes. But I, it seems to me that it might be more accurate to take the views of someone like say Rawls who thinks that Pluralism is the result of certain institutional structures, right? So when you have a free society, um, when people are, are, are allowed to use the free use of their practical reason, they're going to come to very different views of the world, yeah. so, right? So, so we have free, free institutions lead to ideological pluralism, or pluralism of the beliefs of, of beliefs about the world. So, if that's the case, then it's not going to mean that your other point stands, right? So your other, I think the other point is the danger of what you call political idealism is that it's trying to replace this pluralism with some other master value. But right? yes. if it's the case that right. pluralism, right? So if it's the case that the pluralism is simply a sociological result of the free institutions, then simply instantiating some sort of master value without changing the, the free institutions <coughs> is not going to lead to the kind of um, entrenchment of one master value. But how do the free institutions get into business in the first place? What, is a, what are the free institutions? I mean, is um, Magna Carta and the limited monarchy of late medieval England, is that a free institution? I mean, it goes back into Anglo-Saxon times in some respects and keeps on coming forward through the, you know, Puritan Revolution, 1688, etc. Right, but I mean, so the, the way I, I, I interpreted your point was that you think that this, the, the breakaway from the one right order society only comes with the Enlightenment, right? Or the, the decisive break. 
Um, no, the one, one right order societies I think are almost universal. That is, they, they promise a harmony that they cannot, of course, um, uh, achieve. But nonetheless, that's what they promise. And the, the, the notion of, you see, the reason why Western uh, practices scare the wits out of most other people is because it introduces conflict. And conflict in a harmonious, one right order kind of society is obviously trouble. You know, you know it's trouble, and it obviously is trouble. Um, so, you know, that's why I think the West is dangerously uh, subversive to other societies, and simultaneously people from these other societies are frightfully keen to get into the West and migrate here if they possibly can. And I think they do this not just because we're rich, and not just because... If you're living here, you're not likely to be tortured or, you know, slung into into uh, prison. But also because it's freer. You know, I think that it, that ambivalence is there. Yeah. Um, just I guess related to that, but thinking more broadly about the project, I guess whenever we we engage in the, the sort of the project of classifying civilizations, yeah, kind of we come and say, okay, well, you know, these ones are evidently bad. Um, mine is good. And uh, you know, we, we feel very happy about that outcome. But I guess you're always exposing yourself to the, the criticism that, well, hold on here. I mean, do you really stand at that Archimedean point, that objective place, where you can look at them and look at yourself and, and, and come to a conclusion that, that is unbiased and says, you know, I'm actually pretty sure about this. So, so how, do you, how do you come back to, to that criticism? Is it... Well, I or I actually, we all just prefer it over here. No, no, it's it's um, a, as I emphasised about um, our liking for independent people. It's a taste, and it is in respect of these matters that Western civilization has something that other civilizations do not have, and it is at least a matter of some practical interest that people want to get into our civilization rather than get out of it. People don't very much want to get out and live in a, um, you know, uh, in, in other kinds of kinds of, of orders. So, um, uh, I mean, multiculturalism is, I think, perfectly right in that you can live perfectly fulfilled life in a tribe or in, a, you know, in any civilization, that all of them have to cope with problems of life and death and happiness and, uh, and, and relations and so on. So they all work perfectly well in their own terms. What the West has forced upon the world is comparison. People now on seeing things on television, understanding, you know, books spread throughout the world. We are now living in a common world. I mean, Muslims, nearly Muslims, Chinese, nobody knew about the rest of the world pretty much until about 200 years ago. And since then, all of that information leads to all sorts of beliefs, many of them idiotic and so on. It's that, that means that we have been very disruptive and dangerous to other civilizations and maybe to the happiness of the world. Also, this ambivalent civilization we live in has its own worries, problems, defects, and so on. But that's a slightly different story. Um, I think maybe we ought to uh, bring to a close this, your, your taxi. Uh, My taxi is about to, uh, okay. he's probably getting impatient, yes. He's stepping on the gas in just a minute, yes. yes. One more question, oh, if anybody has one. And, uh, yeah. Actually, it, um, I haven't quite formulated this in my head yet, but you mentioned you mentioned that you, you weren't quite sure about what to be conservative about, and I was thinking I'd like to hear you expand on that a little bit, because obviously, you know, the caricature of the conservative is someone in a little town village who wants to protect everything, but you seem to be implying that you, you, you'd like to protect diversity and... Um, I don't know quite... I mean, I'm uh, hopeless of making any practical suggestions about what should be done. But um, the question arose with Margaret Thatcher. Was she a conservative or a crazed libertarian? 
uh, as some conservatives thought. And the answer was, I think, given by a friend of mine, now dead, called Shirley Letwin, who wrote a book called The Anatomy of Thatcherism, in which she said that Thatcher was not consciously doing this, but nonetheless the point of conservatism under Thatcher was a belief that the virtues of the English had become distorted in a sentimental way. That is, that courage, self-control, and so on, had been subordinated to benevolence, uh, talking your problems through, all that jazz. Um, and that the point of uh, Thatcher was really to restore something that was already there. It wasn't a change, it was just sort of restoring something. Um, and that, I think, is an interesting and plausible view of Thatcher's time. Everything has got worse since then, of course, um, and I don't know quite what the hell you would conserve, because at every point you run into some lunatic project dating from the last hundred or so years, some radical project which was supposed to produce a bit of perfection and hasn't. You know, but we quite like it, we've learned to live with it, but I think there are problems with it. Anyway. Yes, yes. Well, if we might thank uh, uh,